Matthew 8, this last section of Matthew chapter 8 is a, a very powerful and dynamic section. Uh, quite well known, I think. Uh, the Gadarene demoniac is one of those stories in the New Testament that uh, I think many, if not most people, are aware of. I want to read actually two passages. I want to read the section in Matthew and then the corresponding section in the book of Mark, which is actually a little longer. But let's begin Matthew 8, 28. When he had come to the other side, to the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs, exceedingly fierce, so that no one could pass the way, that way. And suddenly they cried out, saying, What have we to do with you, Jesus, you Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now a good way off from there uh, was a herd of many schwein feeding. Schwein, that's the German pronunciation. So the demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, Schweinhund, <laughs> uh, permit us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said to them, Go. So when they had come out, they went into the herd of swine, and suddenly the whole herd of swine ran violently down the steep place into the sea and perished in the water. Then those who kept them fled, and they went away into the city and told everything, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. Now, Mark 5, 1, Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, neither could anyone tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran up and worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to me, Come out of the man, unclean. He said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains, so all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So those who fed the swine fled, and they told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that had happened. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him, who had been demon-possessed and about the swine. Then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. Let's pray. Father, as we look at this story this morning, we pray that you would give us insight, understanding, and application into this particular section of, of the Gospel of Matthew and also of Mark as we look at both this morning. Lord, uh, speak to our hearts. We pray that uh, the valuable truth that's contained here would be imparted to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So when he had come to the other side, remember they were there in Capernaum, and Jesus was healing the sick, casting out demons, uh, just doing all kinds of ministry there. He had healed the centurion's servant. He had healed Peter's mother-in-law. And of course, all this miracle working was drawing huge crowds. They were pressing in around Jesus and the disciples, and so they decided to get into one of the fishing boats, possibly Peter and James, or Peter and Andrew, uh, uh, James and John's boat, and they cross over to the east side of the Sea of Galilee. So they crossed over, and remember they encountered the storm, we looked at that last week, after Jesus calmed the wind and the waves, uh, he and his disciples arrived safely on the east side of the Sea of Galilee. In the country of the Gergesenes, or the Gospel of Mark and Luke, uh, say Gadara, the Gadarenes, and so of course there's always someone trying to say, well... The Gospels contradict themselves, which is not true. Uh, Gadara was a city not far from the Sea of Galilee. It was one of the ten cities that were called the Decapolis, 
ten cities around that eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. Um, Gergesa was a city about 12 miles to the southeast of Gadara, so they were and about 20 miles east of the Jordan River. Both of these cities or towns were predominantly Gentile, and that's probably why we see this large herd of swine. But some would suggest a contradiction here, but there really isn't any. Jesus came into this region in which the two cities were located. Uh, Matthew mentions one, Mark refers to the other. There met him two demon-possessed men. Again, Mark's account and Luke's focus on one of the two men in particular. And uh, my suspicion was, and then as I was studying, I found that other commentators had the same opinion, that quite possibly they focused on uh, the worst one, the one who had the more serious condition. Keeping in mind also that, of course, out of the three writers, Mark, Luke, and Matthew, Matthew was the only one who was actually there as an eyewitness. Luke's uh, gospel was based upon interviews with Jesus' mother Mary, other disciples. Mark's gospel is believed to have been handed down to him by Peter, who was also an eyewitness. Nonetheless, he met two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs. Tombs, graveyards, were ceremonially unclean for Jews. And so whenever they would enter a graveyard, they would have to go through a ritual cleansing process afterwards. And also, uh, they were thought to be, and of course things haven't changed much in the last couple thousand years, people back then uh, viewed graveyards as a habitation for evil spirits, and many people still uh, view them that way today. Apparently... These men were almost totally under the control of demonic entities. Uh, and so you could say that these two demoniacs were as dead men walking. And so what an appropriate place of habitation for them there amongst the tombs. Living in or amongst the tombs was altogether appropriate. For all intents and purposes, they were dead. We read that they were exceedingly fierce. And, you know... Uh, the subject matter today is, is one of demonology, really, We're the study of demons. We learn a number of uh, important things here in this passage about demons and how they operate. And in terms of demonology, one of the indications of demonic infiltration or possession, and you probably already know this, but we'll go back over it anyway, uh, one of the indications of demonic infiltration or possession is superhuman or supernatural strength. They were exceedingly fierce so that no one could pass that way, at least not without risking life and limb. Um, must have been hard to bury people in that particular graveyard. Now going back over some of the verses in Mark, uh, Mark 5, 3, had his dwelling among the tombs, no one could bind him, not even with chains. We talk, you want to talk about superhuman strength. Because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, the shackles broken in pieces, neither could anyone tame him and slave. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. So not only was he a danger to others, or they, if you prefer Matthew's account that we're studying here this morning, not only were they exceedingly fierce, but the demons were causing him or them to hurt themselves. And you know, it's interesting. I, I'm not about to say that everyone who practices self-mutilation is demon-possessed, but we have a growing phenomenon in our culture and in our society today, particularly among young people, where they're, uh, because of the pressures, frustrations, of 21st century life, the many broken homes, the tremendous amount of abuse in those homes. We have a growing phenomenon of not just young people, but in many cases young people 
cutting themselves, self-mutilation. And I think it's important to understand the tendency of our secular humanistic world is to ascribe these types of practices to a psychological or a chemical imbalance that we treat with various chemicals and medications. Not surprisingly, we're finding more and more that people who are uh, being dosed with these various types of drugs to treat psychological, emotional conditions are actually going out and doing worse things on the drugs than they did before they took the drugs. To me, this is a strong indication that at least in some instances, perhaps more occasions than we would like to admit, we're not dealing with a chemical imbalance. We're dealing with demonic activity. And there's no way that you can treat demonic activity with chemicals. The only way to deal with demonic activity is with the power of God. And the enemy is very subtle the way he works his way into people's lives. And again, a number of the... the, uh, the um, I'm not criticizing anyone here. We love you no matter you know, what you have done or like to do to your bodies. There's, there's a, quite a, it's become quite popular to do what they call you know, body modification... Uh, piercings and implants and so forth. But I feel an obligation as a pastor to tell you that I don't believe this is simply a cultural fun thing to do. I believe that there is an underlying darkness and the enemy's desire is to subtly weave his way into your life. And he's doing a good job with that in many cases. Again, I love you. I don't care what you look like. We accept everybody just like they are. But I don't think it's, I would think it would be irresponsible for me as a pastor not to at least give you some food for thought. That most of these practices that have even, you know, made their way into the church today have their origins in pagan worship cultic and occultic worship and many of them actually in our modern society began in the homosexual community. And the enemy's strategy is to begin just like the drug culture. You know, it's kind of embarrassing because I've been a musician most of my life but I know that historically uh, people took a very dim view of Actors, performers, musicians, because I don't know if it's the creative nature, the, make, the makeup uh, that results in people being creative, but people within the entertainment industry have had a reputation uh, for being immoral, promiscuous, and I think Hollywood's pretty much confirmed that. Uh, long before the general populace had any clue about what drug abuse and drug usage was within the acting community, the musical community, that kind of thing was rampant. You know, way back then, um, they made a movie, I think it was back in the 30s, called Reefer Madness. Anybody ever seen that movie? And, you know, already the jazz musicians, you know, guys like Gene Krupa, drummer, uh, a lot of these jazz musicians... Uh, and uh, we're messing around with pot and other drugs. But now here we are in the 21st century. I mean, it was scandalous back then, right? Now it's legal in many states. You know, uh, John Denver had no idea when he sang about Rocky Mountain High <laughs> what it was going to turn out to be. All the evidence says this is not a good thing. But is that stopping more and more states from legalizing it? No. But you see how God, uh, not God, but the enemy starts these things within a certain subculture of society, but then the enemy subtly weaves them into the mainstream until everybody's caught up in it. When I was young, the only time you would see a man with a pierced ear was if he was in the Navy 
And I'm not sure what that was all about. Uh, and then village people sang about it in the Navy too. That's a whole other... <laughs> but then the next phase was it, it entered into the homosexual community. But then I guess it was one ear was gay and one ear was straight. I still to this day am not sure which was which. So it's not really <laughs> safe for me to wear one because I don't know if I would send the wrong message. But I have an even better idea. This is just an idea. I'm not, again, I love you. I don't care if you're tattooed from top to bottom and pierced all over. It doesn't matter to me. But it is something that God should be involved in when you make those kinds of decisions. Don't you think? As a believer? You ought to ask God about it. What do you think, Lord? Should I do this or not? But I, you know, my philosophy is God made me I belong to him. It's really his body, not my body. And so I'm going to leave it alone and let him do whatever he wants with it. But that's just a little bit of input there, guys. And I can't help but talk about it because of this story here where one of the indicators of demonic infiltration is this, these guys are cutting themselves. Self-mutilation. Inflicting pain upon yourself. And, you know, I've never had a tattoo, but I understand it's very painful you know, but now we live in a world where everybody's just dying to get one. It is a type of self-inflicted pain. And you could argue the case mutilation as well. I'm trying to present this as objectively as possible. But I don't think there's anybody here today who would want to come under demonic influence. And the enemy is very subtle. It's not normal to want to hurt yourself. Do you get that? You see, here's another problem. We live in a world today that's been engulfed with secular humanism where the people don't think there is a normal anymore. Normal is whatever you make it, right? Whatever you think is normal. But that's not really true. Uh, everything about us speaks of the fact that God has created us with a normal C. One normal C is one man, one woman in a heterosexual monogamous relationship. But is that the commonly held belief today in our society? Not really. But does that make, mean that it's not true? Just because many, if not most, people don't embrace it anymore? No. Normal C. It's not normal. And again, I'm not criticizing you but if you're here today and you're in bondage to self-mutilation or self-inflicted pain, God wants to set you free. It's indicative of an inner torment. Whether it's a chemical imbalance, a psychological issue, or demonic activity. Whatever the source, God does not want you to be tormented. But until we identify the problem, how can you fix it? First, we have to identify the problem, we have to diagnose the condition, and then apply the power of God to it. Do you understand what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Let's keep moving here. Matthew 8, 29, Suddenly they cried out, saying, What have we to do with you, Jesus, you Son of God? Before Jesus even says a word to them, the demons react violently to his presence. The next thing we see here is that they can recognize certain individuals. Remember this story in Acts chapter 19, beginning of verse 13. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. These guys were not believers but they had come to understand that there was power in the name of Jesus, so they tried to use Jesus' name. Uh, these itinerant Jewish exorcists who, men, who went around making money off of supposedly casting demons out of people. Saying, we exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Again, we don't know the guy, but it's working for Paul. And there were seven sons of Sceva... Also, there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. 
And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And the demons proceeded to beat the <laughs> stuffing out of them. And they went running down the street naked and bleeding. Do you remember the story? They did not recognize or submit to these men who had no spiritual authority. They weren't born again. They weren't spirit-filled believers. But they said, hey, we know Jesus. Oh, boy, do we know Jesus. We know Paul. We don't know you. So I would not recommend in any way trying to have any kind of an encounter with a demonic entity until you know Jesus. And you're filled with the Spirit of God. What do we have to do with you, Jesus? We're, we're here to torment. You're here to, to, to deliver. We have nothing in common. Leave us alone, Jesus, you son of God. The way they say it, it almost sounds like a dirty word, but these demons give testimony to the deity of Christ, folks. Well, we have human beings all over the planet going around, yeah, Jesus is not God. He's a pretty good guy, you know, but I don't think he's God. Well, maybe they need to listen to the demons because the demons know who he is. These otherworldly, non-human, trans-dimensional beings authenticate Jesus as the Son of God. Mark 5, 6. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him, and he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. Interesting response. I believe what we see here, we see an initial response from the man. He, he falls on his knees, I think. He ran and worshipped him. But the man's response to Jesus' presence was reverence. But the demon's response was revulsion. You know, sometimes people are diagnosed as with having a multiple personality disorder, this type of thing, schizophrenia. But we see what we see, the man's personality manifesting here as he worships the Lord, but then the demon is repulsed. And you know what? The devil will do all he can to stop any man, woman, boy, or girl from coming to know Jesus. Have you come to, here to torment us before the time? These demons also know, folks, another thing was, as we talk about demonology here this morning, the study of demons, how do they operate? They also know that a time is coming when Jesus will rule the world and they will be cast forever into the abyss, the fiery lake of burning sulfur, Matthew 25, 41. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. See, God never intended hell for men. But the only way we can escape it is by putting our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for the salvation of our souls, for the forgiveness of our sins. But God did not create hell for man. He created it for the devil and his angels. And these demons that Jesus is encountering here are fully aware that Jesus has the power and the authority to send them straight to hell. Revelation 20.10, the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Luke 8.31, they begged him that he would not command them to go out into the abyss. They know they're going to wind up there one day, but they're trying to avoid it for as long as they possibly can. Again, if only more human beings knew and understood what the demons know. James 2.19, you believe that there is one God, James tells his readers. Well, you do well, even the demons believe, and tremble. See, some people approach God from a very general standpoint. Well, sure, I believe in God. I don't know about this Jesus character, but I believe there's some kind of a cosmic consciousness out there, some kind of a supreme being. Well, James says, well, you, oh, you believe in God, huh? Well, even the demons believe in God, and they tremble because they know who he really is. It's not enough to simply believe in God. You must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Paul and Silas 
told the Philippian jailer in the book of Acts. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Many people scoff at the idea of eternal torment, don't they? You know, everybody likes to say, well, I don't know if there really is an afterlife, but if there is a heaven, I'm sure I'll go there. You heard anybody say that? You know? Have you ever heard any? Well, there are some actually out there. Again, they don't know what they're saying. Yeah, I'll probably wind up in hell, but all my friends will be there, and we're going to party. I think not. They're in for a very rude awakening. Many people scoff at the idea of eternal torment, but it is every bit as real as eternal bliss, peace, reward in heaven, and in God's eternal kingdom. See, God has created a very balanced universe. Lightness, light and dark, good and evil, right and wrong, normalcy, common sense. But if you believe in heaven, you must also believe in hell. Luke 16, 27 and 28. Then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. This is the story of Lazarus and the rich man, remember? Lazarus would sit at the rich man's gates. He was all covered with boils and sores. The dogs would lick him, begging there for alms. He dies, goes to Abraham's bosom. He's now in paradise. The rich man dies, and he goes to the other side. Remember? So the rich man's over there simmering nicely. He said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send me to my father's house. Father Abraham he's talking to. Please send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Did Jesus teach a place of torment? Absolutely. He taught heaven. He taught hell. Mark 5, 9. Then he asked him, what is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. This is obviously the demon talking, not the man. A Roman legion consisted of 2,000 troops. One demon can do a lot of damage. Can you? No, man, no wonder this man was cutting himself, crying out, breaking chains, terrorizing the community. So we have now learned another thing we've learned today about demonology. One person can be inhabited by an extremely large number of demons. In this case, about 2,000. And based upon some of the atrocious crimes being committed in our world today, I think there's some more legions running around out there. But we either shoot them or medicate them. They need to be delivered by the power of God. Verse 30, now a good way off from there was a herd of many swine feeding. Again, this was primarily a Gentile region, but there were some Jews in the area as well. We're not told who the owners of the pigs were. We do know it was forbidden for Jews to own or to eat swine. But the Jews of Jesus' day, as I've mentioned before, were for the most part very secular, non-religious. I think sometimes we think of Jesus' entry into the world in this wonderful little country of Israel where everybody worshipped God. It wasn't like that. They were an extremely backslidden state. So it is possible that the owners could have been Jewish. Verse 31, so the demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, permit us to go away into the herd of swine. Notice, I love this part. The demons begged him. When it comes to demons versus Jesus, all they can do is beg. 1 John 4.4, 4, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, the spirit of Antichrist that was already in the world at the time that John wrote his first epistle. You have overcome them because he who is in you. Who is in you here today? That was weak. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Who is in the world? Satan. He's the prince of this world. Jesus is greater. Not Allah. It's not Allah u Akbar. It's Jesus is greater. Amen. 
They begged him, permit us. You got to love watching demons grovel before the Lord. Permit us to go away into the herd of swine. Again, so something else we learn here as we study demonology this morning. Apparently it is necessary or at least extremely desirable for demons to inhabit either a man, and that would be preferable, I think, for them, or an animal. They seem to be somewhat limited outside the scope of controlling a physical entity. Have you looked into Fido's eyes lately? Just don't name your dog Cujo, all right? I love the word permit. They are absolutely subject to God's Jesus authority. That's the good news, folks. I don't intend for a minute to strike fear into your heart here today because Jesus has absolute authority over all demonic entities and over Satan himself. As long as you're in Christ... You have nothing to fear. He said to them, verse 32, Matthew 8, Go! I've been in some sessions where, you know, uh, where we've attempted to cast out demons, and I, you know, I can't say that I know that I know that I know that the person was actually possessed. And that's when you, when you step out in faith and you delve into this realm, you've got to realize, you know, we're not Jesus. We don't know all things perfectly. We make mistakes. But one thing I know from reading the scriptures, you know, we, we were, I've been involved in sessions that went for hours without any apparent fruit. Jesus uses one word. One word. God, speak the word in my life. Amen? Jesus, speak the word. It only takes one word from Jesus. Go! So when they had come out, they went into the herd of swine and suddenly, the whole herd of swine ran violently down the steep place into the sea and perished in the water. Yes, one word is all it takes from Jesus. Just say the word. Remember what the centurion said to Jesus? Lord, no, no, please. I'm not even worthy for you to come to my house. I'm a Gentile. I don't want you to defile yourself. I understand authority. Just say the word. The word of God is powerful. It's alive, it's active, sharper than any two-edged sword. So the whole herd of swine ran violently down the steep place into the sea. You know, being uh, these swine, these pigs, being a lower, more base life form, it would appear that the impact of demon possession on an animal is even more severe than on a human being. The pigs all went nuts, went flying off the cliff into the sea. I think it's doubtful that the demons expected this outcome. Now they're once again disembodied. But you know what? Only God is omniscient. You know, Satan and his demons do have information. They do have knowledge, but it's limited. Only God has unlimited knowledge. Jesus knew exactly. Oh, you guys want to go in the pig cell? No problem. Go! <laughs> By the way, the title of the message is A Case of Swine Flu. <laughs> and they did. Verse 33. Then those who kept them fled. So they flew too. They went away into the city, told everything, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. Mark 5, 13 through 17. At once Jesus gave them permission. The unclean spirits went out, entered the swine. There were about 2,000. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So those who fed the swine fled. They told it in the city and the country. They went out to see what it was that had happened. Then they came to Jesus, saw the one who had been demon-possessed and ha had the legion sitting and clothed. So by the way, he apparently was running around naked. That can be another indication of demonic activity. No, really. In our society, in our culture, it's generally understood you walk around with your clothes on. Right? If someone just goes out in their birthday suit, we could have a problem. Houston, we have a problem. Clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid, and those who saw it 
told how it had happened to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine. Then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. So 2,000 pigs died, one demon for each pig. Secondly, the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion was sitting there next to Jesus. Don't you love it? Clothed and in his right mind. And remember, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, God covered their nakedness. In our fallen, sinful state, we are exposed, vulnerable, and naked. Revelation 3.17 Because you say I am rich, have become wealthy, have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. When we are lost in our sin, that's how God sees us. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich, white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with salve that you may see. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed. I think my paste job here got messed up. Well, anyway, you got the idea. Thirdly, the village people, why am not that group. <laughs> the village people saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind, and they should have been rejoicing. What a miracle! This guy that's been terrorizing everybody, ripping off his chains, running around naked, scaring the daylights out of everybody that comes that way. He's sitting there with Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. Shouldn't they be rejoicing? But what happens? They're afraid. Rather than rejoicing for and with the man, the reaction was one of fear. You know what? Those who fear the power of God do not know or understand him. Matthew twenty two twenty nine. Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken, scribes, Pharisees. You do err. You are in error, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. Folks, we need both. That's what we hope for, we pray for here at Calvary Chapel East. We are dedicated absolutely to teaching the word of God verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book. But we also recognize we need the power of God. Some churches focus totally on the power, and it's a free-for-all. Some churches focus totally on the Word, and there's, there's a deadness and a dryness there because the Holy Spirit is not allowed to move in their midst. Our hope, our prayer, our desire is, and I think that's God's desire, is that we would have both. You do err. You are in error. You are mistaken because you don't know the Scriptures nor the power of God. 1 John 4.18, there is no fear in love. We talked about this recently, last week or the week before. Perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. If you're afraid of the power of God manifesting in your life, I suggest you get to know Him better. Maybe you need to ask Jesus into your heart. Maybe you haven't done that. Maybe you don't know him personally as your Lord and Savior. Because his perfect love, when you invite him in, he is love. He is agape. He comes to live inside of you, and that perfect love casts out all fear. Fear involves torment, fear of eternal punishment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. So he's clothed, he's in his right mind, Folks, every human being on this planet is either in his or her right mind or they're in their wrong mind. Can we agree on that? You're either in your right mind or your wrong mind. How do you get your mind right? Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world. You imitate the people of this world, and I'm sure you can think of a list real quick of ones we ought not to be imitating. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Hopefully that's what we're doing here today. We're letting the Word of God wash our minds, cleanse our minds, heal our minds, transform our minds, that we might think like He thinks. 
Do not be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Until your mind has been transformed by the Spirit of God, by the Word of God, we can't truly know what His will is. 2 Timothy 1.7 For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. How do you get a right mind? You get right with God. You know, <clears throat> you can exercise your demons and their destructive power in your life will grow and grow until they destroy you. Or you can allow Jesus to exorcise them and have life more abundantly both now and forever. John 10.10 10. The thief, the devil, Satan comes but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Jesus says, I've come that you might have life and life more abundantly. Fourth thing, if you're keeping track here, those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine. When you witness the power of God in action, your response should be to go and tell others what God has done. Fifthly, they began to plead with him to depart from their region. God, leave me alone. Get out of my life. You're making me uncomfortable. Many people find the idea of coming to grips with the reality of God uncomfortable. I don't know how many of you know who Kirsten Powers is. I always really liked her. She was a democratic, liberal uh, commentator that appeared frequently on Fox News. Beautiful lady. Well, I just found out, I was reading on the internet, that uh, it was either a year or two years ago, she became a Christian. God pursued her vigorously and she just had this miraculous conversion. And it was so cool and so wonderful to read about that. But she was an atheist. And she said at first, when she realized she, what was happening, it made her mad. She wasn't seeking God. And she didn't want God to bother her. But she couldn't resist. Isn't that awesome? She's on with Sean Hannity a lot, so you may know who she is. But she was just like that. God, leave me alone. Get out of my life. You're making me uncomfortable. Now she's a powerful believer. Again, many people find the idea of coming to grips with the reality of God uncomfortable. He's the great comforter to all those who yield their lives over to him. You know, it's, how many of you believe or know that it's uncomfortable to have a root canal? But you know what? When you, when you need a root canal, it's because there's an abscess. There's poison going into your body. If you don't take care of it, you're going to get a lot sicker before it's over. The root canal may be uncomfortable. Cancer surgery, uncomfortable. A quadruple bypass where they have to split your chest open. Very uncomfortable. Could be uncomfortable to stop living with your boyfriend or girlfriend. To lay down that bottle of booze or that hash pipe. Might not be that comfortable. But all these things can save your life. The discomfort of confessing your sins before God only lasts for a brief moment. Do you realize that? It only takes a moment to confess your sins to God. And it may be uncomfortable for a moment. But the joy and the peace of knowing Jesus lasts forever. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for all that we've learned today from this story. Again, we know this is not a myth, a fable, a fairy tale. This is a real factual, historical account of an encounter that Jesus had with a couple of demonized men. Lord, we are so thankful that you have power over Satan, over his demons. And Lord, no matter how afflicted, I don't know how you could get much worse than a guy with 2,000 demons. It wasn't a problem for you, Lord. One word and they were gone. We just have to get past our discomfort. I pray for anyone here today, Lord, who is sensing even now. They need deliverance. Whether it's deliverance for a demonic invasion, oppression, harassment, whatever it might be. At the very least, Lord, our sins, if left unchecked, are destructive. We need deliverance from our sin. We need salvation. 
We need you, Lord, to come and live inside of us. And when you do, no demon can hang out there. So we pray in these closing moments, as we sing, as we worship, as we wait upon you, that you'd pour out your Holy Spirit. And Lord, right now I ask you to break the power of fear in people throughout this auditorium. They know in their heart of hearts they need prayer, they need deliverance. But the enemy's bringing in that fear factor. Lord, break down those barriers we ask right now in Jesus' name, that all those who need prayer would come, knowing that the uncomfortableness, the discomfort only lasts for an instant, for a moment, and then they receive peace and joy for all eternity. Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.